And uh, we're so excited that you are here with us tonight, whether it's physically here or digitally out there in the World Wide Web. We're just thankful that you would take time out of your, your week to be dedicated to coming and fellowshipping with us and, and studying God's Word. Does anybody remember what we talked about last week? It's a fair question. Baby food. <laughs> All right. That's close. It's really close. We did talk about milk. All right. A baby bottle. Okay. Now, in all fairness, I ask that because I don't know if I shared it or not, but I work in adult learning. And the truth of the matter is, is you likely forgot every single thing we talked about last week. And don't tell, let's see, Sean, Sean, Sean. Don't tell Sean, but that's true too. Okay? So the reality is, is that we're going to do these checks and, and discussions and homework. Who, who brought their homework? Does anybody remember what, they, what the homework was? Okay? To read. Well done. Psalm 119, that I've heard echo out, which is true. Psalm 119, starting in verse 97, and read through 104. So we're going to do that. So last week, we discussed the metaphor of milk to meat. And using that as our illustration of spiritual growth, we also looked at three examples Three examples that we found in Scripture. Samuel. Jesus, yeah, awesome. And Saul of Tarsus, later become Paul. Well done. All right. Before we go any further, we're going to, to pray, and then we're going to look at the song. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have given us a place where we could study your word. Thank you for the safety that we have. Thank you for all the different ways that we can consume your word. Father, thank you for the people that are assembled here together in this building and for those that join us online. Father, we pray that, pray that you would bless each household represented, each soul represented, and those that we interact with, Father. As we study your word, we pray that we will hold fast to it, that we will study it in a way that helps us live our lives closer in union to you, in a way that helps us to reach out to others, and Father, that ultimately you receive glory and, and we get to join you in heaven. Father, we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, so if you would, turn over in your, your Bibles or in your apps or whatever it is, or listen along. We're going to look at Psalm 119, starting at verse 97. And I forgot who led singing tonight, but there is a part of the song tonight in verse 2 that's going to, that speaks to exactly what we're reading tonight. And so I thought that was pretty cool. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate, meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path, so that I may obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Now, how illustrative is this selection of scripture about what this particular psalmist feels towards word of, the word of God? What are some things that we see in there that describe how this person felt about God's word? Okay, 
because of it, he has more insight than all of his teachers. There's an exciting aspect to it. Excitement, okay, kind of a build up to it. All right, so John is contrasting what this particular person writes with what we see out in the world where it doesn't seem like people follow what the Bible says, and there's a lot of foolishness around. And I think we could look out and to see that around the world and, and come to a similar conclusion. Is anybody out here like honey? I mean, like really like it. All right. Okay, so I saw some hands this way. I didn't see, nobody over here likes, oh, one person likes honey too. Okay. Are there different types of honey that you can eat? Okay, so t tell me more about honey. Okay, made from a bee, all right. The flavor of the honey is based on what they're eating. Okay, so the flavor can be based on what they're eating. Color, is there any difference in color that you see? Okay. Flowers? Depends on their flowers? Okay. What did the writer say about the words to his taste in comparison to honey? It's pretty sweet, huh? And, and that is the essence or whatever you want to say around one of these illustrations. How about differentiating things? What is this person able to do because of the, the attitude they have around the word? Sorry? Stays away from evil. Others? I, sorry. Understanding? They gain understanding? Wiser than their enemies. Okay, can differentiate between evil and good. So there's a lot of positive characteristics that the writer here is giving these different types of illustrations to communicate something about the word, something about thinking about these things, and how positive it is and what they're able to do based on that. So if we were going to summarize this into three points around this particular section, there is a passionate love around God's word from this writer. If you were to read the, the first verse in, in 97, they talk about expressing their love for God's word, indicating, I heard something around excitement earlier, it's a source of great joy, a source of inspiration, and one of the things that we're going to build towards based on what we read here and, and some of the other verses, is how important that development is in the way that we view how mighty and powerful and helpful God's Word is. Now, we talked about at the beginning of this class is that we're going to be discussing this movement of spiritual growth in our lives. And one of the things that's critically important, and I, I would assume that since you're here, and since everybody is up to date on their Bible reading, and you've heard Ken talk about it, and you've heard Sean talk about it, and you've seen articles written about it, I'm, I'm confident that you all have a similar attitude that God's Word is really important to us, and spending time with it is really important. And so we're going to continue to build on that and look at the usefulness of it. But this particular person wanted to express how appreciative they were for what God's word did for them and does for them. If you were to skip down and, and look at verses 98 uh, through 100, there is wisdom and discernment that they gain. Now, how many of you folks have ever met somebody really, really brilliant, just super off the chart smart? Anybody? Now, just because you are wicked smart, super off the charts intelligence 
intelligent, does that necessarily equate to anything? No. Have you ever met somebody that's incredibly talented athletically, like they're just the most gifted person in the world? Anybody? Uh, <laughs> a few less hands, but okay. But just because somebody's incredibly athletically talented doesn't always mean anything. The wisdom and the discernment here, it's critically important that that knowledge goes hand in hand with these things. And, and knowing the Bible and knowing God's words gives you that ability to be wise and to be discerning. And as John alluded to earlier, there's some things out there that, that relatively speaking, is not that complicated if your sphere of reference and influence is rooted in Scripture. But a lot of other places, it can be complicated and convoluted and confusing. And so understanding and appreciating that fact that God's Word equips us to discern the complex matters of this world and to be able to separate truth from lies is critically important. Additionally, in our, our third point around this kind of summary of this particular set of Scripture is how, how God's Word is is the guiding source for us, the guiding light, the, the thing that can help us move along whatever path we're on, regardless of the conditions. And, and has, anybody ever, has anybody ever been in a situation where a path was really challenging for you? And when I'm, I'm talking about it, I'm not necessarily talking about your path in life like, you, you made some choices and it was hard or some things happened to you and that was hard. I'm, I'm talking about, have you ever been walking or hiking or, or doing something and the path was just really challenging? Has anybody ever found themselves in that situation? Lots of, <laughs> Chelsea is raising her hand. We, have you ever done that at night also? Just curious. Well, we, we hike a lot in our minds it's a lot I don't know if it is relatively speaking but we like to hike and there are some trails that we've taken a few times and we look out beyond the horizon and we're like I bet if we go that way you remember how the trail loops around we'll we'll hit it well we tried that and the only thing I remember hitting are cactuses we did not hit our path we did not hit the trail that we were certain we were going to hit. We went off, off-roading, off, off-trail, off which they advise you to stay on the trail, and we didn't do that. And it was uncomfortable, and it was difficult. And eventually, my cell phone got a signal, and we saw the blue dot that said where we were, and we followed that over to a trail. And I thought... This was going to get interesting because I'm not a Boy Scout. I, I didn't have a compass. I looked for east and west, and none of it made sense to me. And I feel like I'm pretty good with cardinal directions. But we were off path. We went off the map. And not necessarily prepared myself to do that. And it's fascinating to me how similar in life that can be when we deviate from what God really wants for us. Difficult, thorny, just miserable, not fun, full of, like, what, what happens here? What happens if we get this wrong? What happens if we lose that last bit of daylight? Like, those types of things. And in a similar way, that happens with us in God's Word and deviating from it. The special thing about us in the time that we live in is we have access to God's Word in incredible ways, right? So, so I have a Bible, and if I were to look and, 
in the front of it. It'll have a bunch of dates, but, but the one that stands out to me is when I was given this was back in 2002 um, by Chelsea before we were married. But that's not even close to when stuff like this was starting to be printed, right? And, and we have Bible apps. Like, we have all these different ways to access God's Word. So I want you to think for a moment about how, how they used to access God's Word. Before people had apps and before people had the printed Word, how did they access God's Word? I'm sorry? Hearing. hearing. Okay. So I heard some murmuring, but it, people had to hear it. Memorization. They had to memorize it. It was ingrained in, in all these different things. It's one of the reasons why God asked and commanded in Deuteronomy chapter 6 for these things to be recorded around the house so that people could be reminded of what God had done. I wonder sometimes about that. We have access to the Bible, but we don't always use that access. The printing press changed a lot of things for people and made it simple for, for people like me to be able to, to read. But there's a principle behind this meditation from the psalmist on, on thinking about God's word, having it in his heart. I want you for just a moment to think about what's taking place just over there behind some closed doors for ones that are really little. What is their Bible class like? Sorry? Songs? I'm sorry? Songs and little prayers? Crafts? Okay. Scott's saying it's the milk I was talking about, but there are some things inside the way that our children are taught here in that little age group it's actually really cool when you think about the way that they're engaging with God's Word. There are some things about, you know, singing songs that stay in your mind. There are some things about doing those hands-on pieces that, that sticks with you. But as we age and and the way that we go about doing things, we don't necessarily always do that. So like in, in our class, right, I don't have a set of things for you to manipulate with your hands. And I would bet that if I did, there'd probably be, I don't know, a, a good section of folks that that would like really, it could have nothing to do with the lesson at all, but would really help you process our class and remember it. And likewise, if we did some type of, of limerick or song or, or something to help with some points, it would stick with you differently, right? So there's a, there's a dis distinctive difference, but there is some real practicality by having God's Word present, but then also visible in the different aspects of our lives. How... How do, how do we teach God's word to our children and through other people through our experiences? How do we teach, like our life experience, proving God's word is true? How do we teach that to other people? Or do we? Does, do the life experiences that you have and have had or that you're currently going through, do we share those in a way that proves God is real and God is faithful and, and God is true? 
If we think back to what, come back to you in just a moment, John. If we think back to what we see with the Israelites, there were some, there were some reasons why God said what he said about recording these things so that people could go back and remember them and recall them and relive them. I would think that if you go through your life and, and you were to reflect on some things, maybe at the moment you were going through it, you may not have been able to see God's hand, but hopefully later you could or you can. And it's, it's helpful sometimes when we find ourselves going through different things in life to take that, reflect on it, and remind ourselves that God's faithful. That God was, unbeknownst to us, God was with us. I mean, I can't think of how many different times, and this actually, no offense, there are, there are approximately five Sparks families in this congregation. Two of us are related, and, and they're over here. But this feels a little bit different sometimes, but our childhood was not comfortable growing up. And unbeknownst to me, there are a whole bunch of people that were, were pulling for me and praying for me and, and my brother. And I had no idea that that was taking place through all the brokenness that we were experiencing. But people were. And as I've grown up and I've had other experiences, it was important and has been important for me to reflect on those times that things were incredibly difficult, things were incredibly uncomfortable. I didn't understand what was going on, but God was faithful to me. And I think that's important for us to reflect on and to remember those times where either we were in, in valleys or we were in peaks, but God was there with us. And not only for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others to help them. Now, John, I said I'd come back to you, so. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. So, so maybe what we spoke about earlier with having the knowledge, if, if, it doesn't, if it's not shared, then maybe there's not as much value that we should be more like New, New Testament Christians is what I hear you saying and everywhere we go. Purpose of learning stuff is to spread it. So there is a point behind having God's word, having it, constantly in our minds and, and reflecting on it and how we share that, distribute it, allow it to help others learn through our experience. One of the things that, that I think that's always been an interesting illustration to me is how we view God's word. And one of the examples that always has stood out to me is around how powerful God's word is in the, the illustration of it being a sword. Now, I don't think that the idea of, of the word of God like a sword is anything new, right? We read about it in scripture. We're going to read some different verses around that. But if we think about all the components of a sword... They serve a purpose. They, they offer protection. They offer something for us to defend ourselves with, but also something that we can go on the offensive with. We understand that the word equips us to navigate a world filled not just with the stuff that we hear and see, but the things that we don't hear and that we don't see, but we know exist, the spiritual world, the spiritual battles, the, the lies and deceptions around us. 
The illustration of the sword in, in taking God's word seriously and applying it and, and reflecting on it, it highlights the power and the significance of his word. Are there any verses, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you and I'm going to share some that, that came to my mind, but are there any verses that stand out to you with God's word and the illustration around it being a sword? All right, Hebrews 4.12. I got it in my notes. It's number one. So if we were on some game show, we might see it on the big board. All right, so Hebrews 4.12. Since you referenced it, not putting you on the spot, but is what stands out about it in that context and in, in that verse? Okay, it's... Okay. All right. So if we were to turn over to Hebrews 4 and verse 12, okay, we could read that the word of God is living and active. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and morrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There is a lot of stuff in this one verse about what this is good for. Um, are there any butchers or hunters that like clean meat in the audience? Yes? Yes? Okay. Do I want a spoon, a dull knife? Like, what, what do I want to use to be a butcher or, or a hunter that is cleaning my own meat? What do I need? All right, I need a really sharp knife. I heard something else. Multiple knives. Okay, a cleaver. Why? I mean, the, what I have to think on is the other night we're cooking chicken at home. And we got the quarter legs, like the, the quarters, and I'm cutting through it. And there was some stuff in there that was really hard for me to get through with, with my knife. And it's not the same knife that I would want to use for vegetables. It's not the same thing I would want to use for like peeling potatoes. Like there's some stuff that I really had to cut through. And, and we read that God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And then it can do all these different types of things cutting. And so that's why I ask about any butchers or hunters because... My assumption is you kind of need something special to get through all the different aspects of an animal to get to what you want. And how you separate the different cuts of meat and how you take off maybe the animal hide. Like there are some different pieces that go into that. God's word allows us to do that. God's word allows us to, to go deeply into a person's innermost being, revealing their thoughts, intentions, and moral convictions. The same word that's used in this illustration is also used in describing what Peter carried when he grabbed and cut the ear. Found that interesting. How many of you um, I guess I should ask this a different way. Anybody in here go through ethics and compliance training? Okay, see a few hands. Ethics and compliance. 
Okay, where does that come from? Like, if I want you to behave ethically, what am I teaching you? Morality, what? Some type of standard, okay? Is there something that when, when somebody fills out a piece of paper and they, they sign their name to it and it makes a statement about, I don't know, maybe cash inflows and cash outflows, would it be okay if maybe I said we made more than what we really did? Okay, well, not if I'm a CPA, but that's an ethical, moral issue, right? But if lying's okay, and, like, what difference does it make unless I'm audited or caught? Does it really matter? Okay, well, you can say Enron, but how many of those cases were actually upheld in, ultimately? The convictions weren't upheld. But... We can look at all these different illustrations, but if I want you to behave ethically and morally, how do I establish a standard separate and apart from God's Word? If we were to look at the history of of the Ten Commandments and how they translated into laws, right, there's a foundation that came from Scripture. So it's always fascinating to hear me, or like, when I hear people talk about ethics and morals and and standards and we expect you to behave ethically and we expect you to make wise decisions, if it's never grounded in truth. And yet, we rely on that every day, don't we? And we have all these checks and balances and we have these different groups come in and audit one another and we have these declarations that this person received funding when they completed this study and all that kind of stuff, right? But if there's no grounding in truth, ultimately it it doesn't really matter. It's all the same. But God's word has the power to establish morality. And often when people are confronted with that, they're convicted. They're convicted. What are some other verses that come to your mind as far as the sword and your Bible? Are there others? I'm sorry? Ephesians 6. 6, Tell me more. Okay. All right. That's uh, number two on my list. We're consistent. So, if you continue down into verse 17, we talk about the sword of the Spirit representing the power of God's Word to protect and defend against spiritual attacks and temptations. Does that sound pretty effective? Pretty helpful? You know, why would something like that be important to the people of Ephesus? What do we know about the people that lived in Ephesus? What kind of culture did they live in? Surrounded by idols, but there's something very specific in the book of Acts that we learn about the believers in Ephesus. Does anybody remember what it is? Okay, they studied the scriptures, but they had something that people really downplay now, but they burned a whole bunch of books. Magical books. And here, in in that particular section that's brought up, Paul speaks about the sword of the Spirit. That would be really important for people that were very in tune with the spiritual world and magic and and powers and all this type of stuff. It would be really important for them to understand that God's word actually delivered. That actually made a difference. 
It is one of the pieces of the armor of God. And what a powerful piece it was for them to know and understand and be encouraged about the steps that they had taken and the about face that they made with their lives. Would you say that the Word of God allows us to cut through deception? We're going to spend a little bit of time on that. But God's Word is seen as a tool for cutting through deception, through distractions, through falsehoods. It's something that can offer us clarity and something that we already said earlier about allows us to discern right from wrong. It is really, really helpful tool. Now, how many of you have ever watched a show? Um, I'm going to forget the name. <laughs> Forged in Fire. Thank you, Chelsea. Yes, Scott's like yes. It, it's an interesting show. <laughs> it's awesome. It's coming back on. Okay. Good, because we had some questions in our household if it was going to come back on. But these folks are challenged to forge something that could be a knife, it could be a sword, it could be some type of weird, obscure instrument that was definitely designed to hurt people. And they'll have these different competitions once they complete each step. And it may be something with the handle, it may be something with the blade, you know, the thinness, just really interesting. And there are some parts that really stand out. For instance, um, somebody made, made one of the knives, and the guy's getting ready to test it, and then all of a sudden he's like, there's no way that I can test this because it's going to hurt somebody. It's going to hurt my hand because the grip's all wrong, or it's going to shatter into all these pieces and go everywhere. There is no way we can use this. And there's another guy, and I'm sure that there are some casting, you know, reasons why they did this, but he will take one of these things, and he'll look at it, and he'll, you know, wave it around, and then he'll test it on something. It will kill. It will do what it was designed to do. And that is what we have with God's Word. It has been refined. It has been tested. It has gone through the paces, and yet it still stands. One of my favorite, favorite things is to look at all the, the history that we see in the Old Testament and how it came true. And like to think about people that heard these words and they never got to see that it came true. And then we read about these great historical empires and, and we look at the prophecies about them and the illustrations that were given and we read about all these folks in, in your Western civilization course and your Eastern history classes and it was foretold in God's word. Swords are known for their ability to cut through obstacles and adversaries and God's word has been tested it's not going to hurt you from using it necessarily, right? Similar to the way a sword or a knife is, if you use it properly, it, it's not designed to hurt you. It's designed to be effective. Again, I said we'll look at a, a little bit more of that later. Is there a way that God's word is helpful for us to judge and convict can we use God's word? Can it help us judge and convict? Yes? Yes, okay. I see a lot more heads than I hear, and maybe that's me kind of slowly walking along. God's word allows us to set aside a standard where you, as an individual, can evaluate your actions. You can look at God's Word. You can read what is written here and understand what the standard is. You don't need somebody like me to come up here and say, look, it's wrong to kill. 
right? You don't need something like that. You can read through the words. It's not designed in a way, it's not written in a way that is so convoluted that you need a translator to help you get to the truth. That's not how God's words design. It serves as a moral standard for us to evaluate our own actions and beliefs and relatively speaking, offer something similar to others. I mean, if, if you go through and, and you read the book of Romans and you look in the first chapter and you get to the end of it and you read every single thing that Paul lists off, is pretty much every single thing we could list off in our own society right now. There's no difference. God's word gives us a source of divine judgment and guidance. Now, earlier I mentioned that it's something that can help us both use something on the offense and use something on the defense. And John alluded to it a little bit earlier when he talked about sharing God's word. Okay, that's, that's the offense. It's not going to somebody and totally destroying them and maiming them and all that kind of thing with God's word. It's allowing God's word to penetrate the hearts and minds of people that hear it so that they come to the knowledge of God and make a change in their life or choose not to. God's word is powerful enough to do that. It can also be used defensively for us to protect ourselves, our beliefs, and resist temptation. We can use God's word to protect ourselves, to remind ourselves this isn't new, this isn't different, this isn't anything that somebody else hasn't already gone through or seen or witnessed or experienced. And maybe in some of these cases, the persecutions are nowhere close to what we read about. For many of us in this room, we will never ever experience what we saw here, what we read here. And so we can be encouraged and fortified and, and know that we're okay. That we're okay. So, we read Hebrews 4.12 earlier about how God's word can, can help us and get through the thoughts and attitudes of the heart and revealing truth. Just after our homework verses, Verse 105 of Psalm 119 talks about the word of God being a lamp, right? Very famous, a light, songs about that. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Is anybody familiar with that verse? I see some head nodding. For all scripture is... I'm sorry? God breathed. What's it useful for? Teaching? Correcting or rebuking? Training? So that the unfaithful? No, the servant of God can be equipped for what? Every good work. That's pretty cool. Now, last week we talked about you know, what's special about God's Word, and, and I referenced that I've got books on a shelf that can help me do different things better than what I do them, but not for every good work. I've got to buy a different book. I've got to find a different author. I've got to explore a different thought. But yet, I get it here in one place. So all Scripture is really useful for a whole lot of different things, just like we talked about with the sword. The Bible is described as a source of truth and guidance which allows believers everywhere to recognize, to acknowledge, and to correct. To recognize and correct. All right, what about John 8? Something about truth. What can the truth do? 
can set you free. Right? For a long time, that's all I ever thought about with our country was all these freedoms and how fortunate I was to have this freedom and, and I could explore those things. But God's word frees us from all these things in our lives. And it helps us move forward. So now that was the final bell. There are a couple of other verses that we could look at, but we'll save those. To be fair and honest, I know most of you have heard all of what we talked about before. I want you to think this week as we go forward, why it matters. What difference does it make if we already all know this stuff? Or does it? Thank you.